head roar. And when God brings a deliverance, and you'll notice as you read the Psalms, and you notice again and again as you read the Psalms, how the Psalmist, when God brings the deliverance, there is joy. And when God brings great deliverances in our lives, there should be joy as well. But there should also be joy in the great salvation that he has done. Remember when the Apostle Paul went to the city in Antioch, Acts chapter 13, and it speaks of a large number of the Gentiles believing. It says they were glad. And their hearts were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit and knowing that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from every sin. Isn't that just delightful? What a remarkable God he is to love us so. Joy in salvation and joy even as we come to the table each Lord's Day by Lord's Day, we remember him and we remember him as the man of sorrows, but as that which brings joy to our heart because we have such a glorious Savior. She gave thanks for what he had done, but she praised him. There's none holy like the Lord, this foundational attribute of God, which is the holiness of God. When we get a little glimpse into heaven, whether it's in the Old Testament or it's in the New Testament, in the Old Testament we get this glimpse into heaven in Isaiah chapter 6, and what are the angels praising God about? It's his holiness. Then in Revelation chapter 4, it's his holiness. And there's none like him in his holiness. The elect angels are holy, but their holy is a transferred holiness, as it were. It's given by God, and it can't be compared to God because when the seraphim are praising God, they shield, as it were, their face in his presence because of the extraordinary holiness of the Lord. And she praises the holiness of God because he had brought a great deliverance. And he's the holy God and he rules the world as a holy God. And there's none besides him. He's the incomparable God. He's the incomparable God who had heard her heart as she silently poured it out before God there in his presence in the tabernacle. She's just one woman and maybe the world might think her insignificant, but God heard her and God by his mighty power wrought this deliverance in her life and opened her womb. And who but God could do that? I remember speaking to some young people recently, and we were speaking and comparing God with idols, and we talked about how idols are powerless, they're lifeless, they can't do anything, they're dead. And one of the boys asked me, well, well how do we see the, the life of God, the power of God? Well, we see it in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he raised him from the dead. What other God has power to bring life from the dead? No idol can bring life from the grave. And only God here could do what he did in the life of Hannah. There's no rock like our God. That metaphor of the rock, we see it again and again in the Bible. He's the refuge. He's the fortress for the believer. He's the rock for Hannah. She fled to him and she found him powerful and mighty, a refuge in her time of trouble. And he's the refuge of his people today, even in the midst and surrounded by an evil world. 
and he's the refuge, our Lord Jesus Christ, who we flee to and run from the wrath of God. For there is no other hiding place but our Lord Jesus Christ, for the wrath of God for sin. Oh, he's the wrath. He's the hiding place. That's Hannah's praise and thanksgiving to God. But from verse 3 through to the end of verse 8, we learn how God is very much involved in this world and he judges evil. And she speaks there in verse 3 and she says, Talk no more so very proudly. She gives a warning to the proud. And in the Hebrew Bible, Hebrew does things by repetition. It says, proud, proud. This is exceeding pride. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. Why? Because... The Lord is the God of knowledge. God sees the heart. God knows and men and women may look at actions of certain people and bring their assessment upon it. And certain individuals may seek to justify their actions, but God knows the heart and God sees the heart. And God acts. By him actions are weighed. And then from verse 4 through verse 7, there are seven items in Hannah's prayer by which she describes the overturning or God overturning certain things in life. And the first thing that we see God overturning uh, is in verse 4, the bows of the mighty Men are broken, and those who stumble are girded with strength. The bows of the mighty men are broken. The bows, of course, were the common instrument for war in the days of the Old Testament. But for a bow to be broken, it speaks of defeat. The bows of the mighty men are broken. I think of Sennacherib, King Sennacherib of Assyria, and he came and he surrounded Jerusalem. And God says of him to Hezekiah that he spoke so very proudly against the Holy One of Israel. And God brought a great deliverance, and the angel went out and struck down 185,000 of Sennacherib's army in one night. The bows of the mighty men are broken. But what does it say here? And those who stumble are girded with strength. In the book of Isaiah, and in those latter parts of Isaiah, prophetically speaks forward of Israel, when Israel was in Babylonian captivity, that sin, God had brought his disciplining hand of judgment. And for the children of Israel there in Babylon, so small, so weak, so powerless, what does is, what is God say to them? Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41 and verse 14. Fear not, you worm Jacob. You men of Israel, I will help you, says the Lord. And when God speaks of Israel as a worm, he's not speaking of Israel in a derogatory kind of way, but he's speaking about their weakness. Their lack of strength there in Babylon. Who would bring deliverance? 
God is mighty and God will bring deliverance. God overturns, as it were, what is in the world. God is active in the world and he's overthrowing the mighty and exalting those who are weak. These are encouraging verses, incidentally, for a small assembly. Sometimes as small assemblies of the Lord's people, we struggle, and we're struggling, and we see our lack of strength. But we have a great God and a mighty God, and he is able to see, and he is able to give of his power. And then we find the second item there in verse 5. It says, those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. Just over in the next chapter, it mentions the great evil of Eli's son, Hophni and Phinehas. And God brings his judgment on Hophni and Phinehas because they got fat on the offerings of the Lord. And part of that judgment is that their descendants, that in the line of Ithamar, the youngest son of Aaron, they would have to come and ask for service, even for a piece of bread. God overturned their arrogance. But by contrast, she says there, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. You remember the widow of Zarephath? Our Lord says there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, but God sent Elijah to a widow of Zarephath, and she was on her very last meal, gathering a few sticks before she died. And God overturned it, and God provided through a famine, and he cared for it that widow woman. You see, God, he's involved in the world and he's overturning the natural order of things. And then it says that the third thing in the end of verse 5, even the barren has born seven and she who has many children has become feeble. The barren woman there, descriptive herself, Seven as a full number, as it were, and God blessed Hannah with six children. But God is able and God is powerful when God did this in her life. And but by contrast, and she who has many children has become feeble. When we read that, we wonder about Peninnah. And we wonder, well, what happened to Peninnah's children? The Bible doesn't tell us, but the Bible does tell us in Jeremiah chapter 15 of a woman who does have seven children. And God brought his judgment on Jerusalem and who had seven children would become barren. God was bringing his judgment on Judah. And then fourthly, we find verse 6. The Lord kills and makes alive. The Lord kills. Our life is in the hands of God and well in our world today people want to take life into their own hands. We pass laws on euthanasia as if we are deciding when we will end our life and it's God who has authority over life. God not only kills, but God, he makes alive. And just as Abraham, when he took Isaac to Mount Moriah, believed that God would raise him, and just as Job believed in the one his Redeemer lives, and he would stand on the earth and he would see him and believed in the resurrection, so Hannah expresses here her belief in a God who raises even the dead. And of course, he does raise the dead and he raised the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, from the dead. But the Bible also tells us that there is a resurrection of the righteous and there is a resurrection of the unrighteous. We don't need to ask ourselves this morning, 
what resurrection will we be in? Will you be in the resurrection of the righteous raised to life, or will you be in the resurrection of the unrighteous raised to judgment and damnation? There is a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he can be your Savior today. Well, in the second part of verse 6, she brings out another contrast. He brings down to the grave and brings up and sometimes we find those even near to death in the Bible. David, persecuted by Saul, so often close to death, and yet God brings a wonderful deliverance. Hezekiah, Isaiah tells him he's going to die. Isaiah prays, and God gives him 15 more years. He's brought near to death. Second Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul. And Paul there speaking of that we felt the sentence of death, as it were. But so we wouldn't trust in ourselves, but in a God who raises the dead. That's what God does. Sometimes some come near to death, but God brings back to life. Then we find in verse 7, the sixth thing, the Lord makes poor and he makes rich. I think Job could testify to the reality of this. Job, we encounter him at the beginning of the book of Job, and he's a wealthy man, and everything is taken away from him, and he goes from rich to poor, but at the end of the book of Job, we find him with double the wealth that he had at the beginning. That's the power of God. God is the one who did that, but God also, it says here, and the seventh thing is he brings low and he lifts up. King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man in the world, given the throne by God, and because of his arrogance and pride, he's brought low and he's made to live like a beast of the field for a period of time until he learns his lesson. And then what does God do? God, in his power and his sovereignty, lifts him up and he's king of Babylon once again. That's God overturning God's power, God's involvement. And then in verse 8, Having described these contrasts, it just describes here one who is lifted from the dust. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. Sometimes we say in our day, going from zero to hero. And here we have the zero to hero thing. And to go from the ash heap is to go from the garbage dump. It's where people went and took out their scraps, their rubbish, and they burned it outside the city. And if you are the poorest of the poor, you lived on the ash heap. And God can take one on the ash heap and he can exalt to sitting on the prince's throne. Joseph, he's in prison in Egypt, but it's not too difficult for God. God, by his mighty power, takes Joseph, exalts Joseph, lifts him up, and he's second in the land of Egypt, even unto Pharaoh. That's the power of God, but that makes me think, does it not of the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were at enmity with God. We were, as it were, on the ash heap. But what does God do? Wonderfully, he lifts us up. He forgives us. He justifies us. He declares us to be righteous. He makes us saints unto God. But in the book of Revelation, Chapter 1 and verse 6, he says, we're kings and priests to God. And then he says something at the end of Revelation chapter 3 that I think is just so marvelous. 
because when it describes the believer, it says there, Revelation 3, 21, to the overcomer. To him who overcomes, listen to it, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. What a great salvation we have. What a great God we have. And the one who did it is the one we read, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. And when it's describing the pillars of the earth, it's not describing what the world looks like, but it's using poetic, metaphorical language as describing the earth as a building. And when a builder builds a house, he puts pillars there. And God, as it were, he made the pillars, he sustains the pillars, and because he does that, he is able and he is powerful to rule his world. What does that mean? Because God is active in the world, because God is involved in the world, God is not the God of what is called the deist. The deist believed God set up the world and he rules it like a clock sort of sets it up and he's distant and not involved. No, he is very involved. And he is involved very much in the world today, overturning, exalting, lifting up. I was interested in the testimony and of a man who recently became the third believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He got the third highest position of power in the United States. He's a believer. He's the Speaker of the House of Congress. And he came up, as it were, from nowhere. And when he testified, he said, well, my, my wife's been praying really hard, a lot, and I'm no doubt there were others praying. But you see, God, he's able to do that. He exalts, he lifts up. Believer, we live in the world of a lot of evil. And sometimes the media will push the fear buttons with what it writes, with what it pushes on our smartphones. But we don't need to be fear because we have God who's on the throne and a God who's powerful and a God who overturns and exalts and lifts up and humbles. God is involved, but God shall judge. And when we come to this, we learn in verse 9, for the believer, he will guard the feet of his saints. Oh, we stumble along. I love it, Psalm 37. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. He preserves his people. We're imperfect. We have feet of clay. We have foibles. We have the old man. But he preserves us by his mighty power. Not so the wicked. And he speaks here in general terms, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. Those who speak against the righteous, those who act in proud ways, those who speak arrogantly, what's it say here? They shall be silent in darkness. It's speaking of them down in Sheol, down in the place where unbelievers go after death. There's no more words of them to speak. Earlier on, Hannah, she had been silent, but God had brought a deliverance and her voice was lifted up. But not so the wicked. They there are silent in Sheol. And also, the reason is, for by strength no man shall prevail. The wicked may have money. The wicked may have great armies. 
but they can't stand against God. God is over them. What a shock it was to Saul of Tarsus. Think he was doing service for God, then encountering the resurrected Lord on the Damascus Road. And what was the thing, the very first thing that he heard out of the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He had been fighting against God. It was hopeless. And the world will fight against God. And the world will rebel against God. And the world will speak with proud lips and arrogant words. But they're fighting against the ruler and creator and the almighty. Not only that, he's spoken in general terms. But specifically, verse 10, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. Israel at this time, and even from the days of Samson, the Philistines had been the enemy of God's people. And they fought up against them, that dominated them, that oppressed the children of Israel. And see, here how it speaks how he thundered under Samuel, the son of Hannah. There'll be a revival in Mizpah. There's the children of Israel worshipping the Lord. They don't have an army, but the Philistines come against them. And Samuel prays, and the Lord thunders from heaven, and the Philistines are defeated. Well, that's what he will do. But even more than that, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. This is not just speaking of the days of King David, though he was victorious and conquered much territory, but this looks down even to the days of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to reign and rule in righteousness. Let me read to you from Psalm 2 and verse 8. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. At the beginning of that psalm, the nations are rebelling against God, even as they are rebelling against God today, passing iniquitous laws, unrighteousness, ungodliness, living in rebellion against God. And God, in this present period of time, He's taking out a people for his namesake. But one day our Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. And even down here in little old New Zealand, who are at the very ends of the earth, our Lord Jesus Christ, he is going to rule and he is going to reign in righteousness. God is concerned about the evil in the world and God will one day deal with the evil through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. Who will he do it through? He will give strength to his king. Hannah lived in the days of the judges. Remember that refrain in the, in the book of Judges, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They didn't respect the kingship of God. But God had spoken of a king who was coming as early as the book of Genesis with Jacob, with Balaam. It prophesied one with a scepter coming. Deuteronomy 17 spoke of a king. And Hannah's son Samuel would be the one who would bring the king. He would transition from the days of the judges to the king, and one would come, King David. But the one who will judge the end of the earth is David's son. And he will give strength to him, for we read in Psalm 2 and verse 6, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. The Antichrist with all his armies may come to Armageddon, 
and seek to stop our Lord Jesus Christ, but our Lord Jesus Christ will be mighty, victorious, and he will rule in Jerusalem even to the ends of the earth. And he will, as it were here, and exalt the horn of his anointed. For the first time in the Bible, it speaks about the king as the anointed. Priests were anointed. But the king will be the anointed of God, looking forward to our Lord Jesus Christ, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed of God. He will exalt him. Let me read to you again from Psalm 2. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. You shall break them with a rod of iron. The scepter could be ivory for a king. It could be gold. It could be wood. But when it's a scepter of iron, it speaks of his absolute rule. When he comes, our Lord Jesus Christ will rule triumphantly and mightily, and he will rule with a rod of iron, and evil will be dealt with in the earth. Let's give thanks to God. And Father God, we come again with thankfulness for the hope of the scriptures, for the light of the scriptures, for this encouraging prayer. Mm -hmm. Father, as your people Sometimes we feel our souls vexed, as it were, with all the evil that we're surrounded with. And yet we get a glimpse here of your righteous rule even now. Father, we would seek to be faithful to you. We pray, O oh Father, you who desire the salvation of all men, we pray yet in this 11th hour, as it were, would be powerful and mighty to save. We pray for our government, a new government, that you'd remove evildoers, that you'd cause them to lead our country in the fear of God, thwart their purposes for evil, turn their hearts to do good. And oh, our Father, we pray, and as we think of our coming Lord Jesus Christ, we say, Maranatha, come. Lord, how much we look forward to his coming when evil shall be removed from the earth and our Lord shall reign. We thank you for these glorious things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.